Good morning. Happy Thursday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. Welcome to the Coffee and Coaches conference call. Um, everybody's going to present with a little bit different representation of, of, of how they take information in, how they process it, and then how it's, how it's demonstrated through our behaviors, right? And so um, some people don't have the same tools, right? I mean, you look at, I, I, all you got to do, if you look at everybody's picture on the screen, do you have the gallery view up? Yeah. If you, everybody's picture on the screen, okay. So here's what I want you to do. Grace, I want you to look at everybody's picture for a second, and I want you to tell me who the strongest person on this call is, like physically strong. It's like they pick the most weight off the ground. No idea. Take a look. Well, maybe Take Lucas. Okay, why? Why? Uh, is I've, it because of his, his dashing hairstyle? Yeah, exactly. Profile, neck width. Okay, so you see the neck and you immediately go, wow, that neck goes on a really big, strong guy, right? Okay. So literally, just by looking at someone, you made a judgment call, right? And you're probably right, right? Because again, the, the, the muscle mass kind of goes, goes with the territory. But again, you just have to respect the fact that everybody's going to be a little bit different. And so they're going to process information a little bit differently, a little bit more slowly. Um, in many cases, so if I have somebody that has what I perceive to be um, sort of one end of the, of the movement spectrum capabilities, then I do everything slower. I might need to create a vocabulary for them because if they don't, if they don't spend much time being aware of movement and I need to teach them how to do that, then that's where you, we get this difference between sort of like this internal external cueing kind of a thing, right? Because the, the internal cues are designed to provide a sensation yeah. that most people may not be able to acquire themselves. Um, why do you do manual therapy? Well, you do manual therapy to give them a sensation that they cannot acquire themselves, right? So, so again, we have lots of tools. So we have physical contact, we have, we have verbal cues, we have movement-based activities, we have awareness drills and, and things like that that we would use. And we use them all for everyone to varying degrees. Some people just need a, a much stronger influence in one of those than the other where you take a high level athlete and you just and it literally you just say go over and do that and they immediately know what to do like they just intuitively know what to do because their movement intelligence is so high and then you take the guy that's been you know sitting behind a, a, a desk as an accountant for 25 years that can multiply three four digit numbers in his head in 10 seconds and and we don't appreciate that but we give him we knock him for not being a great mover right because that's what we do and and we have to approach that just a little bit differently we have to respect what people are bringing to the table so to speak right and and again it's just sometimes i gotta go slow sometimes i can go fast sometimes i gotta develop the movement in uh, uh, uh uh, vocabulary so so we can communicate because they don't know what we're talking about right and then we, then don't ever and we all do this but don't ever don't ever belittle someone even internally like when you're when you when you're you're giving your your best cues and everything you think you you, you just knocked it out of the park and they just go what because they just don't have that understanding Right, so we just got to find a way to do that, and and that is one of the the levels of complexity of working with with complex humans, right? It, we just have to figure out the, those ways to do that, right? So so again, you just slow down, and you just find a way. And um, one of the conversations that I have during during the subjective is I always try to find out what people's background was when they were younger. So I say, what sports did you play in school? What was your favorite game? Or like, you know, all that kind of stuff, because that gives me an idea of a frame of reference. So if I get a guy that comes in and he goes, oh, I've done jujitsu for, for uh, um, 25 years, right? 
And, and so now I have, I have a frame of reference. So, so now when I'm teaching him a hip shift or something like that, or I'm, I'm trying to get him to feel something on his back, I go, I go now, it's like, because when you lay him on their side, it feels like a hip escape in jujitsu to them. And so I say, now do your, do your, your right hip escape. And, and they go, oh, so that's what, okay, now they know what it feels like. So you have to create a frame of reference. So again, you try to find that if you can. And then there's cases where everything just, you know, um, is like the uphill battle where, oh yeah, I've never played a sport in my life. I've never really moved. Um, you know, I was a sickly kid. I had a lot of allergies, you know, that kind of, you know, you're going to have these scenarios that come up. You just, and again, I, I hate to default to this, but you just sort of find your way. Right. But, but always respect what they're bringing to the table because they do have some, you know, probably specialized intelligence in, in some way, shape, or form. We just have to kind of figure out how, how we make that connection. So, okay, so let's just talk about analogous structures for a second, right? Okay. So, so when, you look, when, when you're looking at, at, at situations where um, you're, you're looking for the analogous structure, you have to look at it from an embryological standpoint. So things that are derived from the same place, okay? That's, that's one possibility. Um, the, the physical structures are the same, right? The movement behaviors are the same, okay? And so, so when, we look at, when we look at these things, that's how you identify analogous structures because they don't, I, I, they don't all look the same. Yeah. And so that's what you're looking for, right? So, so the point of confusion, when, when, when I say that there's five muscles, in the glute max, I'm, I'm, I, I don't care what you call it. I'm just looking at it behaviorally. And it's like, where else, where it does so many things, right? right. They just said, they just looked at it from a distance 2,300 years ago. And, and the Greek guy looks at the other Greek guy and he goes, what do you want to call that? He goes, I don't know. It's a big one. Let's call it Maximus. They go, awesome. Right. What, right. what they weren't doing, they weren't looking at it from, from a behavioral standpoint. If they would have done that, they would have said, oh, this part does this, this part does this, this part does this, and this part does that. They would, if they would have done that, we would, we would have a totally different frame of reference for that musculature, and it would have a totally different name. Actually, it, it wouldn't have a name. There would be five different names. I got another question that's kind of not pertaining to that. Well, I mean, it is your show. Let's go. Right, right, right. You think uh, like a class in method acting would serve most uh, trainers and uh, physical therapists and coaches well? You, 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 you just warmed my heart. <laughs> so here you go. You ready? Let me hear it. The summer before physical therapy school, I took an acting class. Oh. Because... I am, I am horrible. I was horrible in, in interpersonal situations. Gotcha. And, and so, so that the, I basically, you know, um, threw myself to the lions and, and you have to do like improv and you have to do, I, I had to, I've actually been paid three times to be an actor. Um, but no, um, it's not a bad idea just because of that. Right. To, so, um, just the discomfort of, of, of trying to interact with somebody, right? Um, and it, I, don't, I don't believe in lying to people and I don't think that you should fake anything. It's just a matter of getting comfortable with the discomfort, okay? Um, have you ever, have you done anything like that before? Um, I just have a really close friend that's like, a, that's been in acting school and I guess through him, you know, sort of thing. Like any discussion we ever have always gets brought to acting from his perspective. So like I'll tell him something about coaching and how like I did this and then he'll be like, dude, that was just like acting and like he would lateralize it to his world. Right. And right. We've, we've been buddies. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, but it, it, again, it, it, and it, you don't have to take an acting class per se, but, but it does help to, to gain that, that level of interaction. So you think about like an internship is a lot like that, right? So right. it, all you gotta do is, is have an intern around for like three or four months and then you see the evolution of, of their, their behavior where the personality is totally hidden. They're very, very quiet unless they've had coaching experience in the past or they have this gigantic personality that, that walks in the door. You're gonna see this, this evolution where they're slowly sort of, as they say, come out of their shell. 